What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Martian MMA Podcast. I am your host, and my name is John, and this week we are back with episode 69, where we will be analyzing and predicting the UFC 240 pay-per-view going down this Saturday, July 27, 2019, headlined by Max Holloway versus Frankie Edgar for the UFC featherweight title. This pay-per-view will take place in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and this pay-per-view features 12 fights. The first three fights will kick off at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time on UFC Fight Pass. The next four fights will be on ESPN2 starting at 8 p.m. And the last five fights, the pay-per-view fights, will be on the ESPN Plus pay-per-view starting at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. So you heard it, three different platforms with three different subscription fees that you need to pay in order to watch these 12 fights. The first three, Fight Pass, $10 a month. The the next four fights will be on cable television, which ranges from $30 to $50 a month. And then to watch the pay-per-view, you, you need to pay $5 a month for ESPN+. Plus, and then you need to pay $65 to access the pay-per-view. So the UFC expects you to pay around $110 in America, if that, that is, um, to see all 12 of these fights. So should be a real uh real good card though besides the the normal drama with the ufc the corruption that we deal with every day as mma fans but nonetheless we got 12 good matchups going down and we're going to be analyzing predicting and talking about the betting odds on all 12 of them so with that being said we're going to get right into the fights and the first fight of the evening is kicking off in the heavyweight division we have giacomo limos who is 6-0 taking on tanner boser who is 16-5-1 the opening betting line for this one was Boser minus 125, Lemos minus 115. And right now we are seeing Boser minus 170, Lemos plus 150. So more action coming in on Boser in this matchup. And I agree with the line movement. Uh, these are two debuting UFC heavyweights, and they're both a, a little on the lower end of the skill spectrum. So uh, I will start things off with Lemos. He's a big, stiff, muscle head looking guy. He doesn't look too big for heavyweight, but he is definitely jacked up on some Brazilian supplements. Um, he does not have the best striking defense. His only real defense for boxing is uh, just high guarding. He doesn't really check leg kicks too well, but he has some power in his hands. He can hurt you with his punches. He's hurt uh, multiple of his uh, Korean opponents that he's gone against, uh, like Sun Lee and uh, Jun Su. Uh, he's hurt both of them with punches and knocked them out. Uh, he really likes finishing fights in the second round, which is rare for a big uh, muscle head heavyweight. You'd expect them to go and get you out of there in the first round but he kind of wears down on you and tries to get you out of there in the second round actually four of his six wins have come by tko in the fourth round he does not have you know a uh, great striking technique at all he's not really looking to, to knock you out uh with some clean punches he really likes just making fights dirty uh hitting you with some punches in the clinch uh, he's gone for some some weak takedowns on his opponents and he's gotten them because if his opponents have have just been very low level they haven't had much takedown or striking defense and uh, Lemos has actually been rocked by himself he got rocked versus Jinsu he came back and won that fight but that's something to look out for his chin can be touched and getting over to Boser here um, I originally watched tape on Lemos first and I said wow uh, any heavyweight could probably beat this guy but then I looked over at Boser's tape and I wasn't too confident because he is kind of like a point fighter kickboxer and that's not a good style for heavyweight because the power is always there he does not have the greatest striking defense as well he can be pushed against the cage he uh, can be taken down he has trouble getting off of his back but Boser has fought much better competition he's been fighting over in Russia t- taking on some some really good competition and he's held his own over there he's, he has had a lot of losses but it's because he's facing le- very legitimate fighters better fighters than Lee has ever faced so Boser's style is really just staying on the outside and using his movements circling uh, kicking the legs maybe landing the occasional punch but his output has not really impressed me at all he does not really have much power at heavyweight and you need power at heavyweight or else you're not going to get your opponent to respect you and he's just going to keep marching forward himself so I expect Boser to be standing on the outside kicking the legs trying to avoid the takedown and avoid the clinch 
of Lemos. Lemos is going to be looking for that big power shot, or he's going to be looking to clinch up and try to get this fight to the floor. Uh, if it's on the feet, I think that Lemos will have more power, but Boaster's got the better technique, so I expect Boaster to be circling and avoiding that power shot of Lemos. Uh, once it gets to the ground, it, sh it should be interesting, or if it does get to the ground, because it's not a, a definite or a guaranteed at all, because Lemos's takedowns are not very good, and Boaster's takedown defense is pretty solid. So I actually don't think this one will go to the floor, and if it does, I expect it to be in some sloppy scramble exchange, and I don't expect much of the fight to play out on the floor, but if it does, I expect Lemos to be in top position. But I think the most of the fight will end up on the feet, and I think that that caters to Boaster's style. He wants to take this one to the scorecards and he wants to win on points. And him being the Canadian fighter, I like his chances at uh, out kickboxing uh, Lemos to a decision. I'm going to go with 29-28. Boaster is my prediction in this one. The next fight takes place in the welterweight division. We got Kyle Stewart, who is 11-2, taking on Eric Koch, who is 15-6. and six. The opening betting line for this one was Kyle Stewart, the favorite, at minus 155 to Eric Koch, plus 115. Right now we are seeing Stewart minus 115, Koch minus 105. So more action coming in on the dog, Eric Koch. And I agree with the line movement this way too. So we got Eric Koch, the former featherweight, who moved up to lightweight in his past two fights, is now moving up to 170. He's coming off of a bit of a long layoff. His last fight was against Bobby Green all the way back in January of 2018. So about a 18-month layoff for Koch here and moving up in weight class. So you really got to always take into consideration where these fighters' motivation is going to be at. Uh, if they haven't fought in a while, if they're moving up in weight class, especially a big jump. Like like I said, Coke used to fight at 45. He's now fighting 25 pounds heavier. And is that because he is, his frame is good for the weight class or is it because he doesn't want to cut the weight anymore? You always have to ask these questions. But Coke is a professional. He's a very well-rounded fighter. He's a good southpaw. He's got a, a nice left kick. He can hit offensive takedowns. He has great submissions on the ground. He's uh, pretty solid defensively on the ground, although uh, he was uh, outworked and outclinched and outstruck by uh, Bobby Green in his most recent fight. He kind of faded in rounds two and three of that fight. He did win round one, but lost the last two rounds for the decision. So Coke's still a very game fighter, I believe, even though we haven't seen him in 18 months. I expect him to come into this contest prepared. And luckily, the UFC actually gave him a winnable matchup. He's taken on Kyle Stewart in this one, who doesn't really have one particular area of MMA that he dominates in. He does have a good ground game and some good submissions, but he's not the greatest defensively on the ground. And it showed really evidently in his UFC de debut against Chance Rencounter, in, where he was taken down early in that fight. He quickly got back up, but Rank Counter dragged him back down, took his back, and got the rear naked choke in uh, about half a round. So, very underwhelming performance from Stewart in that one. I do think he is a better fighter than what he showed in that. He is an LFA veteran. He has gone the full five rounds in LFA before. He was also on the Dana White Tuesday night contender series back in 2017 he did have a good showing in that one against jason jackson he was uh, losing the fight early but then was uh, dropped jackson with the right hand a massive punch jackson landed on his ankle kind of weird and uh, a minute later in the fight jackson's ankle gave out and the fight was over so he did win the fight but he did not get a contract went back on the lfa scene picked up a couple victories and now he's back in the ufc so uh he does have a few problems that i noticed in his game uh, his striking defense is not good. I mentioned his takedown defense and his sub defense isn't the best. And he, once he gets to the ground, he, he likes going to the, the case of Gatami or the scarf fold position, which is a really risky position in MMA because you can get your back taken. And I think one of his opponents actually did take his back. I don't remember which fight, but I was watching uh, his fights recently and that did happen. So if Stewart ends up uh, getting this fight to the ground, I expect Coke to be the better grappler on the ground. He's just pretty slick uh, and always has that, that base about him. Uh, I think grappling is kind of the last thing to go. You can be, you can lose your power, you can lose your speed on the feet, but a lot of guys can still hang in the grappling, and I expect for Coke to be the better grappler in this one. Uh, 
I expect Cook to be the better fighter overall in the first round, and uh, maybe even the second round. But uh, you know, Cook's cardio tends to fade. It did against Bobby Green, and I gotta favor Stewart's cardio in the later rounds because he's the more active fighter. I mentioned that he has gone the full five rounds in LFA twice in the past uh, 18 months or so. So I expect Stewart's cardio to be much better in the later rounds, especially with Cook coming off that this long layoff. It's really hard to have. Uh, have faith in his cardio so stewart's path to victory is going to be to pressure coke he, to tr probably avoid the floor in this one because coke's going to be the much better grappler on the floor stewart's going to look to keep the fight standing wear coke down and uh, start beating him up in the later rounds and win a decision uh, so coke is going to look to pr possibly get to this the floor exploit that grappling defense of stewart or just try to outstrike stewart on the feet in this one so i like air coach coke's chances to wins round one and two and for this decision but this is a really close fight and the odds indicate it because it's hard to really know where these guys are at in their career with stewart coming off of this one and only ufc loss and coke coming off of this long layoff as i mentioned five times so far so it's a tough fight to pick but i'm going to lean air coke to win a decision the next fight takes place in the women's flyweight division we have jillian robertson who is six and three taking on sarah frota who is nine and one the opening betting line for this one was robertson minus 145 frota plus 105 Right now, we are seeing Robertson at minus 130, Frota plus 110. So line margins tightening up. It's a very close matchup in this one. So starting things off, we're going to go with Jillian Robertson. She is a grappler. That's what she's coming in to do in all of her fights. Uh, her takedowns are not the best. They're a bit telegraphed. You can kind of see them coming, and her opponents have stuffed them before, uh, most specifically uh, Maria Bueno Silva. Uh Silva did eventually get taken down because Robertson, even though her entries are pretty sloppy, if she grasps her hands behind you, she will transition to multiple different takedowns and she will be relentless and get that takedown at any cost. Now, I'm sure her her takedowns are uh, p capable of being stuffed, but so far many of the women she has fought in the UFC have not been able to stuff them and she, they the fights have ended up on the ground now she did lose one of those fights she was in top position versus uh, Mario Bueno Silva was winning round one but went for some sloppy ground and pound got that arm snatched and got arm barred so even though Robertson is a ground specialist, she's not very dominant on the ground. She doesn't have good takedowns. She doesn't have particularly great top control. And she doesn't have elite level submissions. She does have good submissions, but not elite level. And she's taken on Sarah Frota here, who is a very uh, established grappler of her own. In her UFC debut, she lost a decision to uh, Livia Renata Souza. In that fight, she was really outboxed by Souza and outgrappled too. She couldn't stop the takedown of Souza, even though Frota weighed in, I think, seven or eight pounds heavy for that fight. So that's why you see Frota moving up to 125 in this fight. So Frota's striking defense looked horrible in that fight. She didn't move her head at all. She was just keeping her chin wide open and was eating punches from Souza. Luckily, Sosa doesn't have much knockout power, and luckily, that Robertson doesn't have much striking technique at all. You very rarely see Robertson engage in any type of striking, and her fights are almost completely grappling. So, you know what Robertson's coming out here to do? She's looking to close the distance, get the get the get the clinch, get the takedowns, uh, get the submission. She doesn't really like the position too much. She doesn't like winning rounds. She she chases submissions, and that kind of backfires on her sometime, and I expect it to backfire in this fight because this is going to be a type of fight where it's back and forth scrambles. It's going to be uh, up and down on the feet with some sloppy striking exchanges, and then it's going to go back to the floor. And I see Robertson winning the, striking, or the, the grappling exchanges once it gets to the mat, but I see Frota's defense being... Not only good enough to defend submissions, but good enough to get back to her feet. Frota has some crafty ways of going, getting back to her feet. She uh, uses leg locks a lot, and she uses arm bars to get back up to her feet. But both of these women make a lot of mistakes on the ground. It wouldn't completely surprise me to see one of them make some glaring mistake and the other one uh, get the back of the other and uh, maybe end this fight quickly with a submission. But the, the most... 
likely outcome I see this fight happening is the back and forth, uh, split decision, close type of fight. I think that Robertson will be getting the takedowns. Frota will be getting back up. Frota will probably land the more effective strikes on the feet in these rounds but i see the judges edging the rounds to robertson with top position it's going to be one of those fights where robertson house frota down or is winning the round for four minutes then frota getting up in that last minute or reversing position and starting to land a few effective strikes to close the round now the damage in the round should go to Frota. We're going to think that Frota is going to win on the scorecards, but Robertson is going to get that Canadian hometown lean, and uh, that's why I'm going to be picking Robertson to get the decision in this one. 29-28 Robertson is the pick. The next fight in the UFC's flyweight division, we have Alexandre Pantoja, who is 21-3, taking on Divison Figueredo, who is 15-1. The opening and betting line for this one was Pantoja minus 135, Figurito minus 105. Right now we are seeing Pantoja minus 125, Figurito plus 105. So the early action came in on Figurito in this fight. Pantoja went up to about a plus 120 underdog, and he has since now been bet back down to the favorites. So very close fight. It's getting bet on both sides, but. I honestly see this fight pretty clearly for Alexandre Pantosian. I think that we saw Divison Figueredo exposed a little bit in his last fight, and he had some good performances in the UFC. He was very aggressive. He had some good takedowns, good top control, ground and pound, hit very hard on the feet, was uh, dropping dudes on the feet, had a very impressive win over John Moraga. But then he fought a real technician in Juicy or Formiga and was completely neutralized. He couldn't touched Formiga on the feet. He couldn't get near him with any strikes. He was taken down and mounted and dominated on the ground. He couldn't get off of his back. He couldn't scramble up to his feet really at all. It was just a dominated performance for Formiga in that one. And that was a fight where I think Figueroa was the favorite and people were expecting Figueroa to, I don't really know what they're expecting him to do because what we realize is that Figueredo relies on his athleticism, and his strength, and his power to win most of his fights. Even if you watch the fights with Moraga when he was getting takedowns on Moraga and keeping top position, he was just muscling Moraga to the ground. He was getting his hands behind his back and just not using any wrestling or technique, just yanking him to the ground. And it worked. It worked against some, some opponents. But I think we're realizing now that Figueroa is, is, you know, kind of a powerhouse. He's very aggressive, but he lacks a lot of technique. He lacks fight IQ, and he's taken on a very, very dangerous opponent who I think is just getting better and better fight by fight. Alexandre Pantoja is a extremely well-rounded fighter. He was originally uh, more of a grappler, a guy who would take your back and try to submit you. And since maybe the Ultimate Fighter a couple years ago, he's just his striking has gotten leaps and bounds better. And you saw it in his last fight against Wilson Hayes. He knocked Wilson Hayes out with the right hand. He stuffed the early takedowns of uh, Hayes. He got back up to his feet and he, he floored Hayes with the right hand and finished it off with some ground and pound. So Pantoja's boxing has just looked much improved. He's got real long straight punches. He ha can scramble his ass off, man. He can hit off. He doesn't really hit offensive takedowns too uh, too often. He can really look to clinch you up and take your back from there, or clinch you up and sweep you to the floor. He has he has crafty ways of getting into the floor, but he's not like the typical double leg, single leg, shoot from the outside type of guy. Once he gets you down to the ground, he's got great control great back takes he'll, he'll get that body triangle on you and he could crush a watermelon with that body triangle he got it on dustin ortiz and was very effective in that fight and i, I believe uh ortiz is his only loss in the ufc and that was such a close fight that was a fight where pantoja out grappled ortiz the first round it was a back and forth scramble fest where uh, he ended up on top in round one in round two, Ortiz got the better of the scrambles. It was just back and forth of back takes and scrambling and hitting switches. It was just a wrestler's paradise. And then in round three, uh, Pantoja started the round well. He got the back take on Ortiz, but with about 60 seconds left, Ortiz exploded out of it and landed some strikes on the feet and stole the round in the eyes of the judges uh, for that 2-1 to one decision. So even in Pantoja's uh, only loss in the UFC, he has looked you know, really good. He had a very competitive fight with an, a highly skilled grappler. 
Uh, yeah, I was right about that being his only loss in the UFC. He did lose on the Ultimate Fighter, but he is five and one in the UFC. You know, he choked out Oka Sasaki with a with the rear naked choke. Sasaki's a back take guy. He's a jujitsu rear naked choke guy himself, and Pantoja rear naked choked him. So. Getting down to how this matchup will play out, at range, I expect Pantoja to be two steps ahead of Figueredo. He's going to be lighting him up with straight punches, using his footwork to avoid the, the big uh, explosions of offense from Figueredo. And he should be able to avoid the takedown as well. Pantoja's got great takedown defense, and Figueredo's takedowns just are so telegraphed and untechnical that I think Pantoja will be able to counter them. And if it does end up on the ground, I expect Pantoja to scramble back to his feet to possibly take the back of Figueredo and to get in the top position. So wherever this fight goes, I give the, the edge to Pantoja. The best chance Figueredo has a win in this fight is is landing a power shot and touching the chin of figure of Pantoja, but it's not going to be easy because Pantoja's got the better defense, the better footwork. Um, I really favor Alexandre Pantoja in this fight, and I will eat my words if he takes this loss. But I already got two units locked in on him at around minus one. 20 odds i think i got him at openers at minus 135 and i was kind of pissed to see that the when the line flipped but i uh, got back in on him as a favorite as well so i really missed the line movement in this one but regardless i capped pantoja closer to minus two or three hundred in this fight um so i could be way off on it i could be uh underestimating uh figurito based on that last loss but i like i said i think figurito was exposed i think pantoja is the much better improving fighter and he's really getting into the prime of his career so i expect pantoja to put on another electric performance i see him uh i'll, I'll go with the decision a 30 27 dominant decision for pantoja the next fight takes place in the featherweight division we have gavin tucker who is 10 and 1 taking on Sung Woo Choi, who is 7-2. The opening betting line for this one was Tucker, the favorite, at minus 215, Choi plus 165. We are now seeing Tucker minus 125 to Choi plus 105, so a lot more action coming in on the dog Choi's way. I agree with the line movement in this one, where the opening line was set was just a bit too high for Gavin Tucker. Uh, Gavin Tucker was a guy I don't think I really had ever heard of, and it was because his last fight was at UFC 215 and it was a loss to Rick Len. Uh, he only had one fight in the UFC before that and it was a fight against Sam Cecilia where he outstruck Cecilia all three rounds just staying at range. He's a southpaw. He's, he's got that good left kick. Uh, goes to the leg, body, head, mixes it up really well. It's real fast too. He was he was lighting Cecilia up with that left kick. Uh, and the only problem with his striking really is that he's a bit reckless entering the pocket. And that really showed against Rick Glenn. He struggled getting into the range with Rick Glenn. And he would just kind of blitz into the pocket recklessly and he would get countered. He got dropped in round one with a left hand. And, you know, the fight just got worse and worse for him from then on. It was a 15-minute beating for Rick Glenn. It was a miracle that that fight wasn't stopped. And... It's probably why it was his last fight about two years ago, back at UFC 215, the last time that the UFC went to Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. So interesting to see that Tucker's taking another fight. Just so happens to be on the card in Edmonton. I'm sure that was a very premeditated move. And he's taking on Choi, who made his UFC debut against uh, Moskvar Ivalev last uh this April, back in the Russia card, and what a tough opponent to make your UFC debut against, because Ivalev is just a master elite grappler, he's a master of sport in Russia, and a bunch of different things, and Choi hung in there in that fight with Ivalev, he was hard to take down, he he did get taken down at times, but he did not accept bottom position, he scrambled back to his feet, and he was hard to take down in that fight, uh, he made Ivalev work for all of his takedowns, so... Based on that, I do not think that Tucker will be able to get this fight to the floor if he so chooses. Now, Tucker isn't the most uh, prone to offensive wrestle, so I expect this fight to play out on the feet. Choi is a very long Muay Thai style uh, striker. He's got a good front kick. He's got some decent boxing. Not the best boxing defense. He has been knocked out before. 
He took on an opponent named Jae Woon Kim and was knocked out in 36 seconds in that fight. He rematched him just about six months later, six, nine months later, excuse me, and was losing the fight again. He got hurt with another punch and took advantage of Kim getting a little overzealous and knocked out Kim uh, himself in round two. So it was an impressive come from behind victory on an opponent who had beat him before. So Choi is definitely UFC level. Uh, this is going to be a very close fight. Uh, the one thing I, I I think I like for Gavin Tucker is it's going to be Southpaw versus Orthodox, and he really does his best work when he's uh, fighting Orthodox fighters. He fought Rick Glenn, a fellow Southpaw, and he really struggled, uh, especially a, a rangy guy like Glenn. And he could struggle with the range of Choi because Choi is long. He's got a real long reach, and he uses his, his front kick and his leg kicks effectively to keep the fight at range. So... Ultimately, I think that Tucker will struggle with the range of Choi. It'll take him a while to get back in the swing of things with that two-year layoff, but I see him getting into his range as the fight goes on, and I think that Gavin Tucker will start to outstruck, outstrike Choi in the later rounds. It's going to be a close fight. It would not bl completely surprise me to see Choi come out here and beat Gavin Tucker, but ultimately, I see this being a close striking battle that's going to hit the scorecards. It's probably going to be a split decision. It's probably going to be a 29-28 for somebody. And just like the Robertson fight, I got to side with the Canadian to get the nod in this one. So not a confident pick at all in this one. The layoff of Tucker is, is worrisome. The damage he took versus Glenn is worrisome. And the stylistic troubles he had with Glenn's range is... Uh, also worries me, but ultimately, I think that Choi is a, a winnable opponent for Tucker. I think it's going to be a close striking match, and um, I'm going to side with the Canadian in this one. The next fight takes place in the featherweight division. We have Hakeem Dawadu, who is 9-1-1, taking on Yashinori Hori, who is 8-1. The opening betting line for this one was Dawadu, the favorite, at minus 350. Hori, the plus 250 underdog. Right now, we are seeing Dawadu minus 400. Hori, plus 325. So, even more action coming in on the heavy favorite Dawadu in this one. And I, I agree with Dawadu being the favorite. I'd say he should be about a 3 to 1 favorite in this one. Uh, but four to one is a little, or th uh, plus three twenty five. I mean, for Hori is a little wide, but ultimately, I still favor Dawadu uh, pretty heavily in this matchup. Uh, this is actually kind of a mirror match because both of these guys have very similar styles. Uh, they have similar weapons they like to go to on offense. So we'll start things off with the UFC established guy in Hakeem Dawadu. We got an orthodox kickboxer. He's definitely looking to keep fights in the feet. He hasn't fought two great grapplers yet uh he did fight Austin Arnett who attempted some takedowns on him and he looked good stuffing the takedowns of Arnett uh he got uh, dropped with a punch and submitted with a guillotine versus Danny Henry in his first UFC fight so his defense uh could be better you know he got a little emotional in his UFC debut and got dropped and, uh, and subbed in that one I'm sure he's learned a lot from that loss and I know that he's made improvements from that loss because I've seen him in the octagon since then and he's looked pretty good in both of his performances against Arnett and Bochniak. Uh, both decision wins. He went the full 15 minutes. His cardio looked good. His composure looked good. His defense looked improved. He has real fast punches. He, he had a massive speed advantage over Bochniak. He's got real heavy leg kicks too. He also likes punching to the body a lot. That's one of his go-to things he went to against Bochniak because Bochniak's kind of a zombie and can just take an insane amount of punishment. Now, getting over to Hori, he is a, a Japanese fighter making his UFC debut in this one. He's uh, very light on his feet. He's got a kickboxer style. He's very in and out in his movements. He also has very f fast strikes. He also likes going to the leg kicks. He's got some... Uh, good good body punches as well that's why i said these guys were so similar because they're both kickboxing styles they're both pretty quick like going to the body like going to the leg kicks the one thing about hori is that he does not uh check leg kicks very well 
And another similarity between the two, Hori was dropped uh, or with an overhand right versus uh, Tamura when they fought and was finished off uh, with some TKO punches in that one for his uh, lone and only loss. So both guys have only had one loss and they both got uh, floored with some big overhand rights in that fight. Uh, the one really worrisome thing about Hori is he has never fought the full 15 minutes. And you can look at his record and you see three decisions but that's because in his promotion of pancreas they have two levels of pro fights where they have three three minute rounds and then you move on to three five minute rounds as you become a more experienced pro so despite him having three decisions he's only fought nine minutes maximum in his fights that is you know a huge red flag in this one because I see this one going in the later rounds. I see it want, it being uh, a battle of who can be the better, more technical kickboxer over the course of three rounds. And if one guy has hasn't even fought more than two total rounds, then you gotta you gotta side with the with the Dawadu in this one because not only based on that too, it's because Dawadu is the much more polished striker. I think he's even faster than Hori. He's beaten UFC level competition. You know, Austin Arnett and Kyle Bosniak are no joke. They're both very well-rounded fighters. And I got a lot, a lot of respect for both of those guys. Big fans of them too. So, I favor Dawadu in this one. I see the biggest difference in, in these two guys is their movement. And Dawadu is kind of heavy on his feet. He doesn't have exactly a Muay Thai march, but he's he's very heavy on his feet. He doesn't like using unnecessary movement, while Hori loves unnecessary movement. He's bouncing on the outside. He's switching stances. He's doing all this in and out stuff. And I think that that's not really good for his cardio, especially with him having not gone that full 15. He's been scheduled for the full 15, but he hasn't gone the full 15. Uh, and that's a big difference. You might think you're prepared, but you never been in the, with the bright lights of the UFC. You never been in the toughest fight of your life. And now all of a sudden you got to fight six more minutes than you've ever fought before. It's a huge jump. And that's part of the reason why you're seeing Dawadu is such a massive favorite in this one because he just got a lot of advantages so I see Dawadu uh, kicking Hori's legs uh, digging to the body like he always does uh, lighting Hori up with the punches I, I expect Hori to be competitive in the striking but uh, as the fight goes on I think the leg kicks will add up the the experience of Dawadu will come in and that cardio dump of Hori will come sooner or later and that's where I think uh, Dawadu is really going to pour on the pressure so I'm kind of relying on my uh, my go-to read about the the cardio but I'm going to go with Dawadu uh, for a third round TKO finish in this one. The next fight takes place in the women's flyweight division. We have Alexis Davis, who is 19-9, taking on Vivian Araujo, who is 7-1. The opening betting line for this one was Araujo, minus 245, Davis, plus 175. Right now, we are seeing Araujo, minus 250, Davis, plus 210. So I agree with the line movement in this one. And to start things off, we just got to talk about Araujo's UFC debut. She was a fighter who fought at 115 pounds. Most of her wins have come uh, at the 115 pound weight class. Her only loss actually came to Sarah Frota, who we talked about earlier on the card. Um, she did not seem to have much power on the feet in, in her 115 fights. I remember seeing her having good boxing, fast hands, but she really liked accumulating damage on her opponents. Over in Pancreas, she was just beating chicks up, just uh, unleashing 100 strikes in, in their faces and getting the uh, the referee to stop it. But She had back-to-back -back referee TKO stoppages. Then she m moved up in weight class against Talita Bernardo on about five or six days' notice. So she went from 115 pounds to 135 pounds, took on an established UFC veteran like uh, Bernardo, uh, a black belt on the ground, very dangerous opponent and she came out out there and just styled on bernardo she stuffed bernardo's takedowns easily uh you know pushed down on that head slipped her ankle out of there and, and looked at bernardo like she was stupid for trying to do so and she just outstruck bernardo clean bernardo wasn't a good striker to start with so it's not the most impressive victory but Araujo's striking looked crisp. Her boxing looked powerful. It looked like her technique had improved since the, the fights that we saw her in Pancrase. And then she went on to hit offensive takedowns on Bernardo, and she got them pretty easily. She set them up well, and she put Bernardo on her back. 
Eventually, Bernardo got back up to her feet, and in the third round, Araujo's overhand right just couldn't miss. It was rocking Bernardo over and over again, and eventually she put Bernardo out with a one-punch knockout. And you, This is a girl who moved up 20 pounds in weight class. She said, fuck weight classes. I'm going up two of them, and I'm going to go and knock out this UFC girl who's already had four or five fights in the UFC. No one else had knocked her out. Right, she fought uh, Aldana. Actually, Marion Reno did. Um, but uh, she fought Aldana. She fought Maras. She fought good UFC talent. And Arahu came in in here and knocked her out with some punches. So uh, that's a, that's enough about Arahu. Getting over to Alexis Davis, and you cannot count out Alexis Davis. She is a tough out. You might think that she's not a great fighter because she got finished by Ronda Rousey in 15 seconds a while back and she's uh, she lost her last fight to Jennifer Maya, but she made that fight tough for Maya. She uh, actually won a round of that one. She caught a kick versus Maya in round two, uh, put Maya on her back and kept top position. Once Davis gets you to the ground, she's legit. I believe she's a black belt uh, of her own right and I honestly probably rate her grappling skills a little bit better than Bernardo. So I expect this matchup to be a lot closer. Um, Davis, uh, I mentioned catching the kick of Maya. She's really good at catching kicks. It's like one of her go-to moves. It's like she's just waiting at range, at range, and then she gets you to throw a kick. She'll catch it under her armpit, sweep the leg, and get on top. She's really good at it. And, you know, props to her. You know, so many girls go out there chasing takedowns and using all this energy wrestling. You can bait a fighter into throwing the kick and then you just catch it and dump them and that's what davis's go-to move is so look for arahu to study that on tape and to avoid throwing kicks and look to just outbox davis and she can do that she could beat uh arahu or arahu could beat davis with just boxing she's that much better on the feet and Maya was out striking Davis pretty clean in rounds one and three of their fight to win in the decision in that one and Maya's right hand was was landing clean in that fight over and over again it was landing from you know round one all round and round three too so that's not a good sign for Alexis Davis because I believe Arahu's right hand is a lot crisper than Jennifer Maya's so uh this fight should uh, should play out on the feet. I expect Araujo to, uh, to really dominate on the feet. She should outstrike uh, Davis pretty clean. Should be boxing her up. Davis is looking to be uh, clinching against the cage, looking to do work in the clinch, land some knees and elbows, get takedowns, and win rounds in top control. She could even possibly submit Araujo. It's not totally out of the realm of possibilities. But I think Araujo's takedown defense is is good enough to avoid uh, Davis's takedown. She, she was able to avoid the takedown takedowns of Bernardo, who is a bigger woman with a very uh, established grappling pedigree of her own. So I think that Arahu will also stuff the takedowns of Davis, and I expect uh, Arahu to outstrike Davis on the feet as well. And Davis is tough. She could take a punch. She could take a beating. So I don't think Arahu will finish Davis. I I see it being a decision. I'm going to go with 30-27 decision for Arahu. Actually, I'll give da- I'll give Davis one round. I'll, I'll go with 29-28 Arahu. Had to switch it up there. Had to give some respect to my girl, Alexis Davis. So we are now moving on to the main card of the evening. Starting things off in the middleweight division, we have Christoph Jocko, who is 20-4, taking on Marc-Andre Berut, who is 11-2. The opening betting line for this one was Jocko, the minus 230 favorite to Bayut at plus 170. Right now, we are seeing Jocko minus 160, Bayut plus 140. So a little more action coming in on the dog. And rightfully so, I think that th- this fight is a little closer than the odds, the opening odds initially indicated. This is a really close fight, and it's a great fight to kick off the pay-per-view. Both of these guys are very well-rounded. They are good strikers. They're good grapplers. Uh, very well rounded in the wrestling department as well. So, start things off with Bay Ute. He is coming off of his UFC debut, which was a loss to Andrew Sanchez, but he had a good showing in that fight. He had a tough UFC debut against an established UFC guy like Andrew Sanchez. Sanchez is a tough fighter. He's got good striking, good wrestling. He's really tough to deal with, but Bay Ute gave him a really tough fight. Bayut was taken down in early round one by Sanchez. He started a bit slow. Looked like he, he was kind of feeling the, the jitters uh, of the octagon for the first time. He got taken down early by Sanchez, but was 
did, didn't get put on his back. You know, he got put down to his knees, but he kept fighting. He kept trying to get that underhook, trying to get back to his feet, and he never accepted bottom. He was never really put on his back and kept there for more than maybe 15, 30 seconds. So Bayou was constantly getting back up to his feet. In round two, he started outstriking Sanchez. He was he rocked Sanchez with some punches in the clinch, uh, and almost had him finished in round two. It was went really hard for the finish in round two. Might have guessed himself out a little bit because in round th- three, Sanchez looked like the fresher fighter, and he really just outworked Bayou uh, in that in that third round to get the decision. Uh, it was another a type of round where. Bayou didn't get taken down and put on his back and look like a, a fish out of water on his back. He was It was against the cage. It was like a grinding type of round where uh, Sanchez was on his back and Bayou was just not... He wasn't on the ground, but he wasn't exactly on his feet either. He was just on his knees against the cage and he kind of just let Sanchez ride out top position for a little too long and lost the round. So... It was a good showing, though. As I mentioned before, getting over to Jocko also had a very good performance in his last fight. He was on a bit of a losing streak. I believe he lost three fights in a row, a couple by knockout. He was beating Rye Hall, got knocked out by a massive overhand right from Hall, got uh, finished by Brad Tavares. And then he wanted to come in here against Alan Abadowski and play it safe, go for takedowns, and that's what he did. He didn't fuck around on the feet too much because Abadowski was a dangerous striker and just decided to level change, had really good timing and creativity on his takedowns, and he put Abadowski on his back and he kept him there. But Jocko, his fights are... They tend to be a little low output, you know. As I mentioned in the Amadowski fight, he didn't strike much. He didn't. All he really did was get takedowns and keep top position. He didn't hunt for ground and pound. He didn't chase the submission. I think he just wanted to get his, you know, feet back in the water, uh, go the full 15 minutes, play it safe for a, a fight, and get you know get his wits back about him after losing three fights in a row. Probably in the last fight of his contract, and just wanted to take absolutely no risks in that fight. And that's, that's the way it goes sometimes in, in fights. So you can't really uh, blame him too much for taking the path of least resistance in that one against Amadovsky. But he should be looking to do the same thing in this one because Jocko really likes to clinch in all of his fights. He likes to put you against the cage. It was that, I remember that fight with Dave Branch, it was just one of the most uneventful fights in UFC history, if you remember. Just a total clinch fest on the feet where nothing happened all fight long. So Jocko is looking to be... Uh, clinching again looking to go for takedowns he probably saw bay you'd be taken down by sanchez and he's going to look to do the same because uh, i expect mark andre bay to be the better striker on the feet i think he's got the power and the technique advantage and uh mab's takedown defense is very good as i mentioned before the Sanchez had a lot of trouble trying to take him down and even when he got him down he didn't really get a dominant position he didn't get to advance he didn't get to pass his guard he didn't really get in a position where he could do a lot of damage he was it was just like a battle of control so I think that Bayut's takedown defense is good enough to avoid the takedown of Jocko um, now he might get taken down Jocko could put him on his back for 15 minutes and win a decision that way that's definitely going to be Jocko's path of victory is getting takedowns in top position but the most likely scenario I see is either MAB avoiding the takedown completely just not getting takedown at all or getting back up from those takedowns and starting to outstrike Jocko as the fight goes on so i give the cardio edge and the wrestling edge to jocko but i think that mab will be the much better striker i think he'll have more power and i think that uh ultimately mark andre bay will avoid the takedown avoid the ground game and proceed to outstrike jocko on the feet i, I expect him to touch the chin of jocko so i'm gonna go with the second round knockout for mark andre bay yeah he's an underdog right now uh, it's not the most confident lean. Uh, I will admit, I, I'm a bit of fan, a bit of a fan of Mark Andre Bayut. I watched a lot of tape on him from the TKO promotion, and I was impressed with what I saw. I was picking him to win versus Sanchez, and to be honest, I think that plus 145. I think that's what he was last time versus Sanchez. That's a good bet. It was uh, a back and forth type of fight. He won a round two of that fight. He almost finished Sanchez in round two. He, he was very hard to take down. I think my read was pretty accurate on that. Fight. Fight. So, um, hopefully, I'm not uh, over favoring uh, Bayut in this one. I do not have a bet locked in on him yet, but I probably will lock in some action soon because I like this matchup for Bayut. 
So moving on to the lightweight division, we have Oliver Oben Mercier, who is 11 and 4, taking on Armand Tartukin, who is 13 and 2. The opening betting line for this one was Tartukin, the favorite at minus 305, to Oliver Oben Mercier at plus 225. Right now we are seeing uh, Tartukin minus 200, Oben Mercier plus 170 so line margins have tightened up and rightfully so because where the line open was way too wide for Tartukin and although I was extremely impressed with Tartukin's UFC debut he came in uh, versus Islam Makachev and just had an incredibly close grappling contest with Makachev there was very little striking in that fight but there was some high level wrestling going on in that fight it was one of the highest level wrestling fights that i've ever seen in the ufc those guys were both extremely skilled they were hard to take down they were going back and forth trying to take each other down but their both of their takedown defenses were so good ultimately sarsukin was uh, i'd say one step behind a half a step behind makachev uh, not even a full step behind i like using those terms a lot but Makachev was just a little bit ahead of Tartukin. He was the one who was ending up in top position more. He was the one who uh, was able to to fully secure the takedown on Tartukin. Tartukin did have a few good entries versus Islam. It looked like uh, he was very comfortable wrestling because Makachev is known for his grappling. He is, uh, you know, a Dagestani warrior. He is. Uh, beaten multiple UFC opponents with his grappling before, and Tartukin didn't care about that. He was coming in here to do what he, he knows best, and that's to grapple. It didn't care that uh, uh, Islam was the better grappler than him. He he still went for it. So, really impressive de- debut. His his physical strength and his his cardio looked insane. I'm gonna go out here and make a bold claim then to say that Tartukin is on a few Russian supplements fresh into the promotion and coming in in here putting on that impressive performance where not only he looked physically strong as fuck like kind of stronger than Makachev his cardio just looked insane in that 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 heavy heavy grappling fight so getting over to Oliver Oben Mercier UFC veteran never been finished before he is a, a southpaw striker on the feet he's a decent striker when he's moving forward he can be effective he's got a nice left body kick uh, but when he's throwing punches in combination, he can be taken down. And that's what Gilbert Burns was looking to do with him. Gilbert Burns was also rocking him with punches. He dropped him twice in that fight. And Burns just really dominated Mercier. And that was his most recent fight. Uh, in the fight before that, Mercier had a, a fight with uh, Alexander Hernandez, which was the grappling equivalent of a brawl. They were just going back. It was a complete grappling fight back and forth, back and forth. They were scrambling out of positions. They were giving each other, they were taking each other's back. The one thing that really concerned me in that fight is, uh, Mercier gave up his back a lot and he did it versus Burns as well. It's kind of his, one of his weaknesses on the ground. Uh, uh, Mercier can be taken down too. Uh, Hernandez was taking him down. Burns was taking him down and they were able to, uh, end up in top position and win win the uh the gra- the scorecards in those fights um so i expect this one to go similar kind of to the hernandez fight where it's going to be a, a a grappling brawl it's going to be back and forth and reverse in positions and scrambles and i, I just see sartukin being the one who ends up on top sartukin is going to be the one initiating the grappling because uh i think uh mercier should be the better striker i did watch some of sartukin striking when he was on the the regional scene coming up uh, before his last fight. I wrote down some notes that uh, he has got a decent head kick. He likes throwing a lot of spinning kicks. Um, But in his fight, his only UFC fight so far, he barely struck at all. It was almost primarily grappling. And with OAM's grappling weakness, uh, I think OAM's not a a bad striker either. I I was impressed uh, with his striking in some of his fights. I expect uh, Sarsu going to be looking at, uh, to grapple right away. He's going to be taking OAM down. He's going to be getting top position. He's going to be taking the back of OAM. There's going to be scrambles. OEM's not going to get submitted. He's not going to uh, to give up. He's not going to accept bottom position. He's going to be constantly scrambling. But I expect Sarsu going to be one step ahead. Uh, and I expect Sartukin to follow the game plan that Hernandez and Burns uh, just executed to get their wins. So... The people who are laying the two to one chalk on Sartukin, though, I really advise you to be careful because 
And this fight reminds me a lot of the Nardia fight, which my boy uh, Vegeta p- pointed out over on Twitter. Uh, I had the same thought as him, but I, I didn't formulate the tweet out, and he sent it a little bit before me. Um, so the fight with Nardia, that was a fight where uh, with Michel Prezeris was an incredible grappler. He uh, Nardiev came in, he made his UFC debut. He looked great defending the takedowns. He had a great sprawl and brawl game plan. And then his next fight, people are betting a minus five, minus six hundred versus Chance Ren- Chance Rank Counter. And what happens? Rank Counter is actually a lot more legit than we thought. And Rank Counter beats Nardiev dominantly so all of a sudden people were laying chalk on nardiev all because he had a good defensive performance so sartukin had a good defensive performance versus makachev but that doesn't mean that he is going to translate to this matchup with uh mercier he looked great defensively we we didn't really see him in too many uh, dominant offensive positions versus makachev so i would not be so confident laying that two to one chalk on sartukin I think Sartsukin will win the fight. I would I would cap him. I I, I do cap him around minus two hundred. Um, so you know if you're betting strictly value, you can bet minus two to one. I would bet on him at minus one ninety if if it go, if it goes there. But uh, where it's any more than two to one, I would stay away. And where the where the lines at on OAM right now, I I think it's a pass on him too. If you got OAM around two to one or higher, uh, that's a good bet. But uh, where the price is at now. Uh, I think this fight's going to be a pass overall. Maybe look for some props, the over two and a half rounds, something like that, because I think this one will be a back-and-forth grappling fest. Both of them are solid defensively. I don't think there will be a submission, and I think Tartukin will win this fight uh, 30-27. The next fight takes place in the welterweight division. We have Jeff Neal, who is 11-2, taking on Nico Price, who is 13-2. The opening betting line for this one was Jeff Neal, the favorite at minus 185, Nico Price plus 145. Right now, we are seeing Neal minus 340, Price plus 280. So, a lot more action coming in on Jeff Neal. And I agree with the line movement in this one. That minus 185 opener, congratulations to everybody who got that line. So, starting things off with Jeff Neal, uh, this guy is just blown me away lately he his he's only been in the ufc for three fights so far but man has he impressed me so much in in those three fights not fighting the highest echelon of, of competition in brian camozzi frank camacho and Bilal muhammad but they're three solid fighters you know the the two of them being better than the the camozzi but neil is a southpaw with with wicked striking he's got crisp clean striking he throws power in all his strikes he's got power in his right and his left hand he's got a a nice high kick great fast body kick his left kick is so fast he's got safe side you in his corner just yelling out combinations 22 lasers zero and and neil is like a soldier he just does what he's told and throws the combination when he knocked out frank camacho the you know I think it was uh, Rogan or Cormier's or, or said, "What were you thinking? Did you see this left kick? Well, you know, what made you throw this?" He said, "I don't know. My coach said zero. Zero means left head kick. I threw it. I knocked him out." So it just goes to show uh, how disciplined he is to his coaches. They say something, he does it, and it shows that his coaches, uh, Safe Sayud over there, at Fortis MMA are one of the not only one of the highest level camps but they they know their fighter well they know matchups they see holes and they know that their their fighter will attack those holes if told to do so so uh jeff neal uh most recent fight was against Bilal muhammad he looked really good in that fight with stuff and all of muhammad Bilal muhammad's takedowns he had a bit of a closer round two where muhammad muhammad was landing some some body punches on neal and uh, was you know getting Neil thinking a little bit. He, he 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 took a couple hard shots to the body, but ultimately Neil was in control the entire fight. The third round was a slaughter. Neil was beating uh, the pulp out of Muhammad. Luckily, Muhammad uh, stayed uh, or he lasted into the decision. Uh, but Neil just has looked nothing but impressive so far in his UFC debut. Now getting over to Nico Price, another fighter who I'm extremely impressed by. 
He's an orthodox fighter who is just a, a power striker, man. This dude uh, blitzes forward, and he can be a bit reckless, and he can he can get caught with a punch. He can get hit on the chin and knocked out. Razak Hassan knocked him out. I think he's he was finished by Vincente Luque with with a choke. And his most recent fight against Tim Means. It's a one round fight. It's one of the craziest back and forth fights all year. He started that fa- that fight fast. He he hurt means with a few right hands but means got the clinch he slammed him down to the mat and he smashed him with some ground and pound for a little bit but then nico price used the cage walk to get back up to his feet and was still getting outstruck by means on the feet he was really struggling with the south ball one two of means was just getting hit clean straight down the middle and eventually got hurt with a few punches, was receding to the fence, and landed a massive counter right hook on Tim Means and put Tim Means out cold. Nico Price has got some of the best power pound for pound in his hands in the entire UFC, man. This guy, it just it seems like he's hitting you in a different weight class, and nothing shows that better than the Randy Brown hammer fist TKO from the bottom position. And Price is very solid on the ground. He he occasionally offensive wrestles. He has good submissions, but he doesn't really use them much. He's fallen in love with the striking, and he likes brawling. So, the way I see this fight going out, going playing out, is that it should be contested on the feet. It should be a firefight on the feet, and it's going to be uh you know I think one of these guys is going to get knocked out honestly. So. I favor Neil. I think he has the better technique. I think he's the better fight IQ, the better defense. And, uh, you know, Neil hits hard too. So the way that Means was landing those straight punches and was outboxing Price uh, in that fight, I see Neil doing the same thing here. The, the main difference being that Neil is going to be composed enough and solid enough defensively to when he hurts Price, he's not going to rush in um, – overzealous and get countered and knocked out like Tim Means did. He's going to be calm and calculated and uh, pick his strikes with precision and knock uh, Price out with those ones because the the chin of Price can be touched. Razak Hassan knocked him out in about 45 seconds and it wasn't with anything too impressive. He just swarmed him and threw bombs and knocked him out. So I think Neil will pick Price apart uh, at range. Uh, will be kicking that body, looking looking to set up the head kick, uh, just smashing Price's face with straight punches down the middle. Neil's straight left hand is so money. That thing, is, he, Neil's accuracy is just incredible, man. Man, I've never, I've he's one of the most accurate strikers I've ever seen. So. Price does have a chance to win this one. It's going to be a firefight on the feet. Uh, you know, Neil is is not completely unhittable, although he he is very solid defensively. Price has bricks for hands. Price could get in a brawl and he could touch the chin and put Neil out. He could look to offensive wrestle. Uh, I don't even though I don't think it won't work. Uh, so Price, I'm not completely counting him out. I think at plus two eighty, he is the value side on the betting. I, I I think that where the betting line has got is a little bit too steep for Jeff Neal. We've seen him look good. We've seen him pick up some good wins over the UFC, uh, uh, over UFC level competition. But I believe that Nico Price is the best fighter he's fought so far, and he's going to be in for a tough test Saturday night. I think he's up for the test. I think he wins, but at this odds, it's going to be dog or pass. So I'm going to pick Jeff Neal to get a second round knockout. In the co-main event of the evening, we have in the women's featherweight division, Chris Cyborg, who is 20-2, and two, taking on Felicia Spencer, who is 7-0. and oh. The opening betting line for this one is Cyborg, minus 425, Spencer, plus 305. Right now, we are seeing Cyborg, minus 600, Spencer, plus 450. So, I'll try to make this short and sweet. Cyborg, uh, one of the greatest female fighters of all time. Extremely powerful striking. Got a very powerful right hand. She's also a jujitsu black belt. She's got great takedown defense, great sub defense, and... She has been at the top of the uh, of the UFC, the top of MMA in the women's uh, division for the past decade. Now she did suffer her first uh, major uh, UFC or major MMA setback. I think she lost like her first fight like 12, 13 years ago or something like that. Uh, yeah, her first fight back in 05. and so her first loss in uh, over a decade came to Amanda Nunes in her last fight. She was leg kicked early in that fight. She came out too aggressive. Was not paying uh, respect. To to Amanda Nunes' power, 
got hit with a couple of right hands, uh, got rocked real bad, and got knocked the fuck out by Amanda Nunes, a, one of the most vicious, iconic knockouts in MMA history. And uh, Cyborg lost her 15-year undefeated streak in 51 seconds by the hands of Amanda Nunes. So getting over to Felicia Spencer, he made her UFC debut last fight, uh, was able to take down Megan Anderson, get their back, get the rear naked choke. Actually, she didn't even take her down. She just took the back standing, got her down, and got the rear naked choke. Now, Spencer did get hit with two right hands in that fight. Spencer is a, uh, a jiu-jitsu black belt and a taekwondo black belt, so... Spencer was coming out to look to take the fight to the floor, but started off kicking a little bit. Anderson caught a kick and threw a right hand straight down the middle, and it rocked Spencer. It didn't, you know, it didn't have her, uh, you know, out of it or anything, but it, it woke Spencer up. Uh, then oh, a couple seconds go by, Spencer got hit with another right hand, and she said, "You know what? Fuck this strike, and I'm going for the takedown." She uh, went for the takedown. It was real sloppy. She her takedown entries are so sloppy. They're desperate. They're not very technical. And she she was able to get Megan Anderson down. She was able to get the back of Anderson and tap her out. But she's not doing that shit to Cyborg, man. If this fight's on the feet, I will not. You will not find one MMA fan in the world that thinks that Spencer will able to hang with Cyborg on the feet. It's going to be a complete mismatch if this fight stays on the feet. Cyborg is miles ahead of Spencer. Spencer's defense is bad. Um, I could even see Cyborg knocking Spencer out with the first couple punches that she lands. The, the way that this fight gets competitive is if Spencer is able to get this one to the floor. But with the way that Spencer's takedowns are set up they're they're telegraphed they're sloppy they're untechnical and the fact that when she gets you to the ground it's not like it's end-all be-all it's not like she's uh, the most dominant grappler she's actually kind of struggled finishing her opponents i remember taping her before the anderson fight and there were a couple instances where she got on her opponent's back but wasn't able to tap out or ta tap them out for uh maybe five seven minutes of working and you're just not going to keep cyborg uh you're not going to take cyborg's back you're not going to keep her there for five minutes you're not going to tap her out so I'm, I'm not giving Spencer no chance. It's certainly possible that Spencer comes in here, gets the takedown, and taps Cyborg out. But I would give it about a 5% chance of happening. I'd say Spencer's more likely path of victory is winning three the winning rounds in top control. She's going to take Spen uh, Cyborg down and keep her on her back and just edge the rounds out. She's not going to submit her. She's just going to edge the rounds out. I'd give Spencer about a 10% chance of that happening. The other 85%, that's Cyborg. So... The odds are about right for this one uh, with Cyborg at minus 600. Uh, I, you know, if you want to make some parlays for this fight, honestly, Cyborg's price at minus 600 is pretty accurate. I, I would, I wouldn't hesitate to move her odds up to minus 900, which is which Bet, Bet DSI has her at right now, minus 909. You might think minus 600, minus 909 sounds like a huge difference. It's not. It's it's 83.3 percent difference compared to uh, 90 percent difference. So it's only the seven percent difference that you're talking about there. Um, so. I expect Cyborg to roll in this one. I expect her to stuff the early takedowns of Spencer and knock Spencer out. It might not. Spencer might not even attempt a takedown. It could just be like a clean knockout, one punch thing, like uh, like uh, Masvidal over Askren, or most notably like a Duranda May over Ladd. I think Spencer will just plot forward, uh, kind of not really knowing what's coming, and just get floored with a right hand. So the pick is going to be Cyborg to win by first round knockout. And in the main event of the evening for the UFC Featherweight Championship, we got champion Max Holloway, who is 20-4, taking on Frankie Edgar, who is 23-6-1. The opening betting line for this one was Holloway, minus 350, Edgar, plus 250. Right now, we are seeing Holloway, minus 400, Edgar, plus 325, so... Um, more action come in on Holloway's way, although I'm sure there are a ton of people throwing in some action on Frankie Edgar. Um, very notable name. He's an established veteran. He's been in the UFC for 10 years now, former lightweight champion. He was, uh, at one point, uh, an elite-level fighter. Unfortunately for him, I think that that day has passed uh, for him. So let's talk about why this fight is happening first of all edgar and holly were supposed to fight at ufc 218 uh edgar pulled out of that one and aldo filled in for edgar holloway beat aldo 
UFC 222 was the it was scheduled again. Holloway versus Edgar was supposed to happen in Vegas. This time Holloway got injured and had to pull out. And instead, Frankie Edgar fought Brian Ortega. Brian Ortega knocked Frankie Edgar out. And Edgar lost his title shot temporarily. Ortega got the title shot. Ortega lost. Edgar bounced back with the victory over Cub Swanson. And what basically happened, and the UFC has clarified this, the UFC was appreciative of, of Frankie Edgar taking that short notice fight against uh Brian Ortega, and they said, win or lose, we will give you the next title shot uh, versus Holloway. That must have been the deal that was made back in March of 2018, and surprisingly enough, the UFC is honoring that, that handshake agreement or whatever they had with Edgar here, because Edgar has one win, is on a one-fight win streak. That was over Cub Swanson, who is not even in the top 30 at featherweight anymore and that fight was 16 months ago back in ufc atlantic city on april 21st 2018 that's off the top of my memory by the way so in that fight if edgar went in there and knocked uh, swanton out in, in two minutes and looked incredible doing so i understand giving him the title shot he looked so underwhelming in that fight he didn't attempt any takedowns he just was content to go in there and outbox Swanson, had had pretty low output, but just did the bare minimum to get by and beat Swanson in a tactical fight. It never really looked like he got out of second gear. Um, so it's really questionable why the Edgar is getting this title shot. I really disagree with it. You had Volkanovski a couple uh, months ago pick up that victory, 30-27 in Brazil over Aldo. And you give the, the fight to Edgar uh, here instead of just waiting a few more months. I also don't like the fight for Holloway because three and a half months ago, he fought Dustin Poirier. That fight was at lightweight. He lost that fight. It was a five-round fight. He, I believe, lost four rounds of that fight, and he took a massive amount of damage. He took 150 strikes or something like that, and that's lightweight strikes. He wasn't used to taking punches at lightweight. He moved up 10 pounds in weight class, then took a massive amount of damage at the hands of Dustin Poirier. So the, the Poirier matchup is pretty irrelevant in this in the discussion of this fight, but you got to look at the damage that was done to Holloway in that fight. That was three and a half months ago, and he took a beating in that fight. And the, the thing that I'm thinking about even more than the damage that he took in that fight is that Holloway had trouble making 45. You know, he is... He never missed weight. He's, you know, a professional. He is, uh, you know, just uh, the epitome of a fighter. But... He has struggled to get down to 45 before. I mean, he he openly talks about walking around at 185 pounds or more out of fight camp. So he fought at 145 pounds in December of 2018. He won that fight. He fought at 155 pounds in April of 2019. And now, just three and a half months later, he's dropping back down to 145 to defend his belt again. Now, as a Max Holloway fan, I, I'm worried because, you know, you're cut. That's a lot of weight to be cutting. You're cutting to 45. You know, he didn't have to cut as much to 55, but now he's got to go back down to 45. So, he fought last time at 55. His body might have gotten used to that weight. He might have gotten used to carrying around the extra 10 pounds, and it might be harder for him to cut that extra 10 pounds now. He might have put on some extra muscle for the Poirier fight, and now he's got to deal with uh with cutting more. So. I've spent the first few minutes just talking about the storylines behind the fight, behind why Edgar got the shot, behind Holloway coming back from the, the, the quick turnaround against the poor A loss and going back down to 45 after 55. So that's a little bit of the narrative around the fight. But now let's get down into the technical analysis. And uh, we will start with the champion, Max Blessed Holloway. And... He's he's a boxer. That's that's what he does best, and he's one of the best boxers in the UFC. He's got an insane pace, insane cardio, and output. He was known for throwing th two, three hundred strikes a fight. Uh, he just get he honestly gets better as the fight goes on. He he feels you out in the beginning. He plans his movements, and then he starts 
putting the pressure on you and just i mean he landed something like a hundred punches in round four versus ortega so it just goes to show how great his cardio his volume his pace his pressure is he wants to walk you down and outbox you he doesn't throw many kicks the, the occasional kick here and there but he doesn't want to risk getting taken down, and that's he's not going to be throwing kicks in this fight because he's going to be worried about getting taken down versus Edgar. But I honestly beat that he, believe that he can beat Edgar with just boxing. I think the Holloway's takedown defense is, is very good, actually. If you watch the Ricardo Lamas fight, that was the, the most recent time he fought a, a guy with a real wrestling pedigree. He did fight Ortega, who is known for his grappling and his submissions, but Ortega doesn't have good takedowns. And... There might have been some takedowns in that fight. I don't really remember. I didn't rewatch that one uh, in in preparing for this fight because I didn't think the matchup was too relevant. Max was one step ahead the entire time. Ortega would land the occasional power punch. Uh, he might even had Max rocked in round three a little bit. That could have been o over exaggerated about the commentators, but I don't really remember too many takedown attempts, and it probably wouldn't hurt to go back and rewatch that fight, but. I think my my read has been made on the fight, so uh, we're going to transition over to Edgar, and he's got great boxing of his own right. He's got uh, real good fundamentals. He hasn't used his boxing too effectively recently. He he's not you know uh, knocking people out. He's not using too effective combinations. He kind of was just throwing single shots versus Cub Swanson to get him the victory, and he really needs to be moving forward and pressuring you to be effective. When Edgar is moving backwards off of his uh, back foot and circling, he's just not nearly effective on offense, and even though Edgar will have a three-inch reach advantage over Holloway, it won't seem that way. Even when you see them trading punches in the pocket, Holloway just uses his length and his reach, his range, so much better than Edgar. Edgar kind of fights like his arms are shorter than they are. He likes throwing a lot of hooks. He doesn't throw many straight punches, while Holloway lives off of straight punches. He's got a wicked fast jab. He'll switch stances, hit you from all different angles. And Edgar does switch stances. He can uh, hit you from different angles as well, but I just don't think his striking is nearly as effective as it once was. And... You really have to go back to the the fight with Jeremy Stevens to see Edgar's last impressive performance. Well, he did have a, a good performance against Yaya Rodriguez, um, but that yeah, Rodriguez has bad takedown defense. He's primarily a striker, and that victory wasn't really impressive because it was a fight he was favored to win. It was a matchup that was very ca uh, catered to Edgar, and if that fight happens uh, ten times, I think Edgar wins nine or ten out of or eight or nine of those times. So. Not as impressive of a victory. The Stevens victory is more impressive because he showed better pace in that fight. He was using his pressure. He was getting takedowns in that fight. But that's really the last time that Edgar used his takedowns effectively, besides the IAR fight, I know. But uh, he didn't really. Edgar didn't go for takedowns versus Ortega. He didn't want to go for uh, put Ortega in his own realm of things in the submission area. And he didn't go for takedowns versus Swanson. So we haven't seen him go for takedowns since May of 2017. And we're basically relying on Edgar's takedowns, his setups to be great, his entries to be quick, his transition from uh, single leg to double leg to body lock to all that stuff to be to be on point. And it's entirely possible that he, that Edgar's wrestling is the going to be the difference maker in this fight. It's going to be Edgar hitting takedowns and keeping top position and pressuring Holloway and putting him against the cage and outworking him in a classic Frankie Edgar performance like he like he did when he was the lightweight champion or his early days at featherweight. But I just don't see it, man. I think Edgar's days are past him. I think he's not in his prime anymore. And I think Holloway is still in his prime. And although Holloway did take uh, a beating last fight, he did suffer his first loss in like 13 fights versus Poirier. He is coming off that quick turnaround. We got a little bit of, uh, of worry about his weight. I still think this matchup is very good for Holloway. I think that, uh, you know, both of these guys like pressuring. They both are effective when they're coming forward. So you're going to see them colliding early. And it, those exchanges are going to be either met with a level change from Edgar or they're going to be met with some uh, exchange and punches in the pocket between the two of them. So I expect Holloway to be ready for that early shot. I think that Edgar will try to mix in the takedown early. And I think that Holloway's footwork, I think that his takedown defense, his defensive grappling is good enough to deal with Edgar's grappling at this point in his career. 
this fight happened five years ago, Edgar would be the favorite, no doubt. If this fight happened even three years ago, I think Edgar would have a great shot to win the fight. But with uh, Edgar's activity dropping off in the past few years, hasn't fought nearly as often. He suffered his first finish. He got knocked out by Ortega. I'm not saying Edgar is shot. I'm not saying that he has no chance to win this fight. I'm just saying that I think that the clock has expired a little bit on this one. I think that he could have had a chance. He could have been a closer match up in the past but at, at this point in time I think that Max is going to be uh, too good for Edgar I think that he will outstrike Edgar on the feet pretty easily I expect uh, I expect Max to be lighting Edgar up with the, his punches and accumulating a ton of damage and I expect him to be stuffing the shots and keeping this fight on the feet um, so Edgar's path to victory is to uh, to pressure Holloway to maybe gain some respect and uh, hurt Max with a punch, then look to get the level changes, then look to laying ground and pound on the ground, keep top position, maybe even hunt for a submission. But I don't like Frankie or I don't like yeah Frankie Edgar's chances at, at accomplishing that. I would give his chances around. 15 to 20 percent of him uh hitting takedowns of him keeping top position him winning rounds and possibly getting the finish i don't give frank yeager a good chance of winning this fight i think it's max holloway's time he is the featherweight king uh kings defend their land and that's what max holloway is going to do in this one so i see the damage accumulating uh like it typically does in max holloway fights and i'm going to predict a max holloway third round knockout in this fight so not too many bets on this card locked in so far. Uh, I, I think I have a pretty good read on a lot of the fights. I'm confident in my reads and my uh, analysis tape study for the fight. Uh, not too many bets so far as well. Just going going through looking at, at the stuff. I think that the value is going to be on Lemos in that matchup. Uh, it's going to be a pass on the, 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 the Coke versus Stewart fight entirely. Maybe fight goes the distance in that one. Fight goes the distance seems like a good prop to play in the Robertson Frota fight because I believe it stands at around plus one eighty five right now, which is just insane. There's not very many props out. It's only the only goes the distance props. I think there is value on Pantoja at minus one twenty five, and he is I believe my only play on the card so far uh, for a two unit play at around minus one fifteen one twenty. Uh, Tucker versus Choi, it's going to be a pass for me, but I like the goes the distance on that one as well. Uh, Duadu uh, is going to be a pass, maybe even a little bit of a value stab on Hori because, uh, you know, I think that, that line is a bit wide. Uh, Arahu, I think she should roll, but the value side is on Davis in this one. Um, Bayute is going to be the fa or is going to be the value side in that one. I will probably lock in a one unit play on Mark Andre Bayute. I will just kind of monitor the price. If it starts going down, I'll hit him around plus one thirty five. If it goes up, I'll hit him there. Uh, OAM and Sarsukin should be a great fight. I'm going to pass on that one. That goes the distance is minus three hundred. It's an also a pass. If Sarsukin's price drops any more around one seventy one eighty, you know he could be playable, but. As far as that fight goes, I think I'm going to sit back and just enjoy the grappling scrambles in that one. Uh, Price, he is, he Nico Price has a good price, I'll tell you that. Plus 280 for him to land that counter bomb on uh, Jeff Neal and touch the chin, it, it's a good price. It's definitely dogger pass in that fight, as much as I was raving on about how impressed I am with Jeff Neal, that fight's dogger pass. Uh, Cyborg at minus 600 is value, honestly, like, but go ahead and lay your 600 to win 100 on on, uh, on Cyborg in that one because that's a great matchup for her. And the, the main event is also a dogger pass. I cap uh, Holloway around minus or around 75 to 80% uh, implied probability, which is where the odds stand right now. But with all of the things uh, I mentioned earlier in the podcast with Holloway going back down to 45 uh, with him taking some damage in his last fight and the fact that Holloway uh, hasn't hasn't really faced too many high level wrestlers. His most of his fights have been striking. Uh, he was out grappled early on in his career by Dennis Bermudez and Conor McGregor even out grappled him. So uh, the weakness in Holloway's game is definitely his ground game. So it should be a great matchup. It's 
I favor Holloway, uh, you know, pretty heavily, but I would not lay the chalk, and I might even end up on a little bit of a, ba- a value stab uh, on Frank Yeager at that plus 325. So that's going to do it for the Martian MMA podcast. This has been the episode 69 of the podcast, and I hope everybody enjoys the pay-per-view going down this Saturday, and I will catch you all next week. Peace.